This story begins early in the morning, when nature is just beginning to awaken. The main character's house stands here. The wind blows old newspaper pages along the street, and women's screams are heard from the house. A girl shouts to her husband Jack Hops to beat her if he is a real man. But the man doesn't care about the cries of his wife. He lies, snoring in bed after another binge. In the middle of the room on the floor, among broken alcohol bottles, sits a girl in only a peignoir with disheveled hair, screaming through tears and asking to beat her half to death. Jack's hand trembled, drops of sweat ran down his face. He heard some sounds and he began to feel sick. The nausea becomes stronger and comes up to his throat, and from the amount of alcohol he drinks, he vomits right on the bed. Suddenly he wakes up and screams very loudly, not understanding what is happening to him. A beautiful night city unfolds before us, all in lights and high-rise buildings. In one of these buildings, Jack Hops is relaxing with his colleagues. They drink to their superiors. Everyone is joyful and happy. Suddenly, the hero has something in his throat. The glass falls and breaks into smithereens. He cannot take in air and take even one breath and falls from lack of oxygen to the floor. All of Jack's employees ran to his lifeless body. Panic begins. Someone shouts that they need to call 120. His eyes opened. Waking up, he realized that he could breathe. Drops of sweat began to flow down his face. Not understanding anything, he was overcome by panic. He sat down in the middle of the bed and tried to remember what happened and where he was. Having calmed down a little, he looked around. Not understanding what was happening, he put on the slippers next to the bed and headed towards the exit of the room. Buttoning his shirt, he left the room, all the time asking himself the question of where he was and what happened. When suddenly he stops and sees his name and age, he begins to remember everything in a panic. Jack comes to know how he got married, drank heavily, how he beat his wife, and how his parents died due to improper handling of work equipment. He began to shake. Panic grew. He remembered everything, and not believing what happened, he realized that he had been reborn. Coming to his senses, Jack heard a woman crying coming from the next room, and he began to follow the sound. On the floor, among the fragments, sits a blonde girl, all disheveled and in tears, through her tears, she says that Jack Hops is an asshole. A man enters the room. He was surprised when he saw the girl and hesitantly greeted her. The girl raised her head and looked at him in surprise. Realizing that Jack had done all this, blushing, he turned to the girl by name and asked for forgiveness. She was very surprised that she could not even answer anything. There was a knock on the door. The main character headed towards the front door. Opening the door, he saw on the threshold a dark-haired girl, Sarah, with a boy about six years old, Mark, Jack greeted them. Taking a closer look, the hero noticed that Sarah had a bruise on her face. He screamed in surprise and asked what happened to her face. And then the knowledge comes to him that it was he who hit her, blaming the girl for the death of her parents. Sarah looked at him intently and said that Jack was asking stupid questions and that they had come to get some money because little Mark had not eaten for 24 hours. Jack Hops invited Sarah and Mark to go into the house. He asked Helen how much money and provisions they had left to which the girl replied that there was only five yuan of money left, but there were ten kilograms of rice and two kilograms of flour. Jack looked at Helen and asked her to do him a favor and walked towards her. The man approached his wife and asked her to give all the money and rice to Sarah. He said that there would be enough flour to feed him for a couple of days, and he would figure out what to eat later, the girl agreed. Helen took the old tin where she kept her savings and took out the last bill, handing it to her husband. Jack gave everything to Sarah, turned around and headed towards the exit. The girls looked at him in surprise, not understanding what was happening. Helen called after him, asking where he was going. Jack paused in the doorway for a second and replied that he wanted to talk to Frank. The hero walks along a spacious, crowded street, past signs of shops with household tools and trade stalls with fresh-baked goods. Jack stood out from the crowd of passers-by. He was thoughtful, so he walked slowly and carefully, not in a hurry. Hops walked up to an old, dilapidated, low-rise building and stared at the windows of the top floor. They were wide open. Jack headed inside. Standing near the shabby walls, on the staircase, he thought that it was very strange that his parents, having worked for twenty years at a steel plant, being professionals in their field, could not cope with the equipment. Jack continued to think, and the thought came to him that Frank, being the director of the plant, would gain fame and a good name if he paid compensation for the death of his parents at work, he should not refuse. It was already dark outside the window. The moon hung in the sky. He stood and looked at the sky, when suddenly he heard some rustling in the entrance and rushed towards the sound. Two men, having risen to the floor, walked at a leisurely pace to the door of the apartment. Frank took out the keys and began to open the door. 
The man standing behind him was nervous and chewing his fist. Jack stood behind the men and called out to them. Frank and his friends stood in a stupor of surprise. The men turned around sharply and screamed in surprise, their hands clenched into fists, as if they would immediately rush into a fight. But Jack stood behind them and smiled sweetly at them, asking a question about the fact that they had just arrived. One of the men rushed at Hops with his fists, shouting that he had gone crazy. Frank came closer and asked what he needed. Jack folded his hands in front of him, palm to palm, and said that he had come with a request. The man became wary, narrowed his eyes and, a little stammeringly, asked what kind of request he had come with. Jack, still holding his hands in front of him and smiling, began to say that his parents themselves were to blame for their death, and he just came to apologize on behalf of his sister. Frank stood in bewilderment for a couple of seconds, but then began to say how caring Jack is, and Sarah always blames him for the death of her parents. Jack nodded his head and said that Frank was right, and he came to ask for money as compensation for the death of his parents, since money was tight. The man clearly did not expect this, squinting his eyes and muttering something under his breath with a dissatisfied face. Jack clenched his hands into fists. With anger in his eyes, he shouted that if the plant didn't pay, he would start a riot. He had nothing to lose, but at least he'd have some fun before he died. Frank began to calm him down, saying that if a riot starts, the police will take him away, and what will happen to his family then? But Jack became even more angry and said that he didn't care what would happen. But this way, he would find out who was responsible for the death of his parents. The man's face became serious, and he narrowed his eyes and said that Jack's parents were to blame for the accident. Frank said that he was friends with his parents, and instead of the authorities, he would pay the compensation himself, to which Jack said that if we are talking about pennies, then he will do what he has to do. The man came closer to Hops and took him by the shoulder, saying that usually compensation for death at work is 600 yuan, but he is ready to give 500 since he himself has problems with money. Frank asked Jack to wait while he went to get the money and walked towards the door. He entered the room, headed to the shelf with books, and began to sort through them, in search of the treasured book with savings. Jack, meanwhile, stood in the doorway and waited. After fiddling around a bit, the man found the required amount and approached Hops, holding out his hand with the bills and told him to take the money. Jack went out into the street, clenching the money in his fist. With anger in his eyes, he said that Frank would still pay for the death of his parents. Footsteps were heard. The hero turns towards the sound and sees an old man coming out from around the corner, the merchant holding a tankula in his hands. It had long since gotten dark. Helen was at home alone, waiting for her husband, when suddenly there was a knock on the door. She opened the door. Jack stood on the threshold, joyful and with a tanhulu stick, he shouted happy birthday. The girl was discouraged by such an appearance of her husband. She stood in a stupor and did not even know what to answer. A little embarrassed, Jack asked for forgiveness for the meager gift, but explained that it was very difficult to get a good gift so late in the evening. Helen took a bite of the sweetness and said that it was incredibly delicious, inviting Deku to try it too, but he refused. The main character looked at her with tenderness in his eyes and said in his head that when he left, the real Jack Hops would treat her well. Helen went into the bedroom. Jack looked at the clock. It was already late. A woman's voice was heard from the room. She asked if he was going to bed. Hops was surprised and froze for a moment. It's already deep night outside. A crescent moon in the starry sky illuminates the gloomy streets of Japan with bright light. Jack is lying in the same bed with Helen. She is already fast asleep, but he cannot sleep. The girl's breasts open so seductively in her peignoir and haunt the hero. Jack began to sweat and blush, convincing himself that it was someone's wife and not his. The sun begins to rise from the horizon. The first roosters wake up and greet the sunrise. Jack jumps out of bed at the crowing of the first roosters, cursing them in his head and saying that he will kill him someday. Hops could no longer sleep after the rooster crowed, and in order not to disturb the girl's sleep, he went into the kitchen. After some time, steps were heard in the corridor, and Helen looked into the kitchen. Jack stood at the table with two bowls of noodles and chopsticks. He said that it is better to celebrate a birthday late than never. There were two plates of showman on the table. In one plate, there were noodles with an egg. Jack prepared it specifically for Helen, and he borrowed the egg from Aunt Wong. The girl, with a look of surprise on her face, asked if he had stolen the eggs from a neighbor, to which Jack repeated that he had borrowed them and promised to return everything to the old lady. Helen saw a wad of money lying on the table. In surprise, she screamed, where did this money come from? He also borrowed it. Jack picked up a wad of money and told the girl that this was compensation for the death of his parents at work. Helen, with the same serious and surprised look, 
asked why the company would pay compensation if the factory said that Jack's parents died due to their own fault. Hops became serious in his face and said that Frank gave him the money instead of the bosses so that Jack would not start a riot. Helen asked what he would do next. The main character stood up, resting his hands on the table and stated that he would collect evidence because Frank would not be able to hide everything and after paying the money he would think that Jack had calmed down. Hops collected the empty plates from the table and said that this money would be enough for them for a while. Helen looked at him in surprise. The girl jumped up from the table and said that Jack didn't look like himself at all. He stopped and froze for a couple of seconds. Blushing, the main character turned towards Helen and asked what she was talking about. He smiled and offered to divide the money. She would take 200 yuan and he would keep 100 for himself, give another 100 to Sarah, and with the remaining 100 yuan, they would buy food. After listening to Jack, the girl agreed. He said that he would go look for Sarah. Going out onto the street, Hops passed by Aunt Wong. She asked if he knew where her eggs had gone. Jack admitted that he took them while the old lady was away. Wong yelled that Hops was being unceremonious and that she didn't allow anyone to take anything. Jack stopped and took money out of his pocket, handed it to the old lady and told her to take two yuan for those eggs. He walked further and Aunt Wong shouted after him with joy that next time he could take as much as he wanted. A red-haired, muscular man in a tracksuit stood leaning on a lamppost. It was Nick Locke. He called out to Jack and asked where he was going. Hop stopped and greeted Nick. The red-haired man offered to team up to win money, said that in the evening there would be a game for money against Chuck Gordon. Jack became interested in the proposal. His face became more serious. He asked if it was the same Chuck Gordon, if his father was the former director of the Linshu Steel Plant, and now Chuck himself works there. Nick said that he would come by today and asked if Helen would be at home. Jack thought that he would need to meet with Chuck. The main character waved his hand towards the red-haired guy and said that he would come to him himself. Nick stood and watched Jack leave, saying in his head that Hops was a coward. His face became more angry. There was a drop of envy and sadness in his eyes. He thought about how lucky Jack was with his wife. Jack arrived at Sarah's house and went to the front door. Touching it, the door opened. Little Mark looked out from behind the door. He was happy and shouted to his sister that his big brother had come. Hearing the baby's cry, Charlie looked out of the kitchen and asked what happened. Mark stood joyfully and pointing at Jack, repeated that his big brother had come. The main character stood with a grin on his face, waving his hand at her. Charlie's face immediately changed. It became more serious and reserved. She was not very happy about his arrival. Jack came into her kitchen, rolling up his sleeves. He offered his help. The girl, greatly surprised, did not say a word. Hops walked up to the table and, with a serious expression on his face, began to knead the dough. Charlie stood silently and looked at Jack, not understanding what was happening. The door opened. Sarah came into the house with a smile on her face, and from the threshold she asked if the food was ready. Jack looks out from the kitchen, greeting Sarah with a joyful look. He replies that everything is fine, and the noodles will be ready soon. The girl's face changed dramatically. Now she was very surprised, and with a drop of dissatisfaction in her voice, she asked what Jack was doing at her house. The young man remained silent, looking towards the kitchen. He turned around and went to continue cooking. Hops began to stretch the noodles, and turning to Sarah, said that he was cooking now, and suggested that they talk later. The girl, with anger in her eyes and irritability, asked why Jack was so wasteful with flour. Hops again broke into a smile, turning to Sarah. He said that he could afford this, because he had money. The girl asked where it came from. Sarah got angry and started asking what else he did for a living besides moving, selling things, gambling and beating his wife. Jack couldn't answer. He just put his hand in his pocket and pulled out a stack of bills. Hops handed the money to Sarah and said that she had exams soon and she needed to eat more. It was good for her head, but she couldn't refuse food. The girl couldn't stand it and screamed at Jack to admit where he got the money. The main character began to calm her down, pushing Sarah to the table and said that he had prepared the meat and they could talk after eating. There were four plates of delicious noodles on the table. In the middle of the table, there was a large plate of meat. Everyone sat down at the table and during the meal, Jack said that he took the money from Frank. Sarah and Charlie shouted out loud in anger and surprise, repeating what Jack said. Hops jumped up and said that the parents could not have died due to their negligence, that Frank had purchased faulty equipment. Sarah immediately faded. There was grief in her eyes for her parents. The only thing she could squeeze out was a questioning sound. Jack continued, that this is why this old man was involved in the death of his parents. He did not want to check the equipment, so first he will collect evidence. Sarah repeated Jack's last words. Hops continued that to buy equipment. You need documents, 
and he will find them, contact the seller, and then Frank will have nowhere to run. Jack raised his tone, and poking his chest with his thumb, he said that the girls would not have to worry, and he would do everything himself and prove the innocence of their parents. Sarah and Charlie sat stunned, eyes wide open, silently listening to their brother. Jack handed little change to little Mark for candy. As he left, he wished Sarah good luck in her exams and said that he would take care of paying for the tuition himself. Leaving Sarah's house, Hops heard a local ice cream vendor calling and he headed towards the sound. Approaching the ice cream cart, Jack turned to a nice girl trader and asked for one ice cream. The girl took out one ice cream and breaking into a smile, handed it to Jack, explaining the cost. The main character sat down on a nearby bench and enjoyed the taste of ice cream. After taking the first bite, he said that what they say is true. Each era has its own characteristics. After sitting for a while, Jack stood up and headed towards the store, when suddenly someone touched Hops on the shoulder and called out to him. Jack stopped and turned around, continuing to chew his ice cream. It was a group of young people. A red-haired girl greeted Jack. The main character immediately recognized the couple standing in front. In his head, he pronounced their names Bob Brown and Lilith Miller. Jack smiled, waving his hand to greet the group of young people. Among them, he recognized Catherine Wilson. She seemed to be Helen's best friend. Looking at Catherine, Jack thought that usually the richest dressed well in any group. A young man with rough features, furious, rushed at Hops, shouting that he was crazy. And why was he staring at Catherine like that? Bob stopped Steve Jones flying at Jack. He asked why he wound up so well after all. But Steve wasn't going to calm down. He tried to roll up the sleeves of his t-shirt, continuing to shout that Jack pretended to be cool when Bob Brown was around, and he still didn't understand why Helen was in love with him. A girl from the crowd, giggling and covering her mouth, took up Jones's words and said that maybe Helen Smith loves bullies. Jack finished his ice cream, stood and listened to what the young people were saying. Having finished the meal, Hops broke into a smile and turned to Steve and said that he had misunderstood everything because Helen and Catherine were friends. How could he behave like a bully in front of his wife's friends? Catherine pulled Jones back with a displeased face, telling him that everything was fine and to calm down. Catherine looked Steve in the eyes and said that they were just in the same class and asked him to leave with her. Jack stood and looked after them as they began to move away. Lilith turned around and smelled Hops. The main character turned serious in his face and said in his head that Steve Jones's life would not be carefree for a long time. On the way, Jack went to the store to buy groceries and carried full bags home. Hop saw Helen coming out from around the corner. She was carrying a net with a watermelon. The girl was surprised to meet her husband and began to wipe the remnants of sweets from her face. Jack asked Helen that she also ate ice cream. She was stunned by such a question, stuttering. But still, Helen replied that she had not eaten ice cream for a long time so she decided to try it, and she also bought a watermelon for Jack. Hops broke into a smile, put his hand on Helen's head and began to stroke her. Continuing gentle stroking, he said that they had enough money, and Helen could buy whatever she wanted, and in the future they would have even more money. The girl smiled shyly and agreed with her husband. Jack offered to take her bags because she was tired, to which Helen said that she was not tired. Hops had already taken her bag and walked towards the house. Helen was surprised and embarrassed, the girl closed her eyes, saying his name. For a moment, she imagined how they were walking in paired clothes. Jack was carrying two large thermoses with his strong arms, and she was following him and laughing. Jack stopped and said that the couple was going home. Why was she in the clouds? Helen opened her eyes and joyfully ran after her husband. It's night. The full moon illuminates the dark streets. Women's pickaxes are heard from Nick Locke's house about someone dying on the street. Jack knocked on the door. A girl screamed from the house for Nick to come out and an angry lock flew out into the street. Jack asked Nick what happened, but the man asked him to move away from the house. Moving away a little, Nick told Jack that he had lost a little money in the morning, but his girlfriend had given him a hard time about it. She didn't understand that in the casino they both win and lose. The red-haired man looked at Hops with a smirk and asked if he knew Principal Chuck Gordon's son. Nick hugged Jack and continued, without waiting for an answer, that Chuck is very rich, so it will be very easy to get him hooked on the casino if Hops and Locke team up. Jack moved away from Nick, smiling, and asked how much money he brought him. Locke hesitated a little and laughed, said that Helen had not yet paid him his salary and he could borrow money from Jack. He would pay him back when he repaid it. Hops scratched the back of his head, smiling, and said that Nick owed him another three yuan and the hero only had one yuan with him. Locke got angry and shouted at Jack that he came to play and only took one yuan. The hero without removing the smile from his face, looked at Nick and said that he had no money at all. Jack 
waving his hand, began to turn around and said that maybe they could play another time. Nick grabbed Hops by the hand, smiled, and said that there was no need to leave. They had already come to play, and Nick would lend some money to Jack. Locke walked away a little, took off one shoe, and took out a couple of bills with a smile. He showed them to Jack. Hops was very surprised and looked at it with his mouth open. They approached the building from which a man came out. He was walking with a dog and asked if it was Nick. The man was surprised that Hops also came and invited them to go into the house. Nick turned to Chuck where he brought them. They wanted to play. Gordon told Locke to stop, that he had been carrying fruit for his grandfather all day today and would carry it again tomorrow so they could play here for now. Locke smiled and turned to Chuck, saying that he had heard that there was a new game and asked him to teach them how to play. Gordon invited the men to sit down at the table and said that he would now teach them everything. With a cigarette in his mouth and a serious face, he began to explain that a standard deck of cards is used. Three cards are placed face down on the table. The rest are dealt equally to three players. The first bet is made by the player who received the card during the deal. The player who placed the highest bid takes the cards from the table and becomes a landowner. Smiling, he said that he was responsible for his words and this game is very cool. The remaining two become peasants and play against the landowner, holding a cigarette in his hands. He continued that both peasants win if one of them wins. The combinations are simple, as usual, like three. Pairs of threes, pairs of fours. Jack sat listening, leaning his face on his hand, and in his head he said that this game is called Do Diju. Chuck started shuffling the cards and suggested we start, saying he would be the landowner. There is a full moon in the sky, the same Chuck Gordon house, from which comes a cry that someone has won again. Satisfied with a cigarette in his mouth, Chuck throws the cards on the table and says that he has a pair of sevens. Nick smiled. Gordon looked pleased and said that he had two of them. After looking carefully at the cards, Jack said that he had a pair of eights and waved them. Locke looked at his cards and said that the guys were lucky, and he folded. Chuck threw two more cards on the table, laughingly shouting that he had a pair of tens. Gordon, with admiration and joy on his face, said that he won Saurian again. Looking at his cards, with the cigarette still in his mouth, Chuck said that he had a pair of sixes and again two combinations. Jack with a serious face put two cards on the table, saying that it was a pair of kings. A joyful Nick threw his cards on the table, shouting that it was his turn and he had a pair of aces. Locke immediately shouted that he should go after the landowner. Jack sat, not understanding what was happening. Still with a cigarette and a serious face, Chuck said that he was passing and the guys were cool. Nick, looking carefully at his cards, said in a sad voice that he had nothing left to play with and he could only throw away the highest cards. Hearing this, Chuck smiled, saying Nick's last words, and threw the vault card on the table. Looking at Jack with a grin, Chuck asked if Hops was folding and exclaimed that he had won again. Nick smiled and gave Gordon a thumbs up, telling him he was handsome. Jack looked carefully at his cards. In his hands there were four deuces and a couple more cards. Scratching his head with a sad face, he said that his cards were bad again. Nick, with a satisfied face, puts four cards on the table, asking if it's his move now and saying that he has a bomb of sixes. With a smile on his face, Jack holds out his four cards and says that Nick is lucky, but he has a bomb of deuces. Nick opened his mouth in surprise and an angry Chuck with a cigarette in his mouth said that he was giving up. Hops happily boasts, saying that he has three bombs and a black joker, four yuan for each combo. Turning to Nick, he asked where his winning money is. It's already deep night outside, but the men, they still continue to play without leaving the table. With a big face, Chuck holds the card up and tells everyone that he has won again. Nick, very angry, hits the table with his fist and shouts that these are all stupid cards. Jack reminds Locke that he already owes Gordon almost 100 yuan. Nick got even more angry and started shouting that in a couple of games he would win back. Shuffling the cards with a serious look, Jack, turning to Locke, said that he had nothing left to bet. Maybe he still had money hidden in his socks. Nick jumped up from the table and yelled at Hops not to talk to him like he was cheap and that they weren't done with the game yet. Jack threw the deck of cards on the table and barked at Nick that he would talk to him as he wanted and that Nick should take out the money if he was going to continue playing and if there was no money, he should get lost. His face became serious and he told Nick right to his face what if he pestered Helen anymore. Moving even closer to Nick, his eyes sparkled and he continued that he would bury Locke alive. Turning to face Gordon, Jack smiled and thanked him for the game, said that it was time for them to stop and that he had already won a lot, so tomorrow he would treat Chuck at his own expense. Gordon looked at Hops in surprise, without letting go of his cigarette. He simply opened his mouth without answering. He left Chuck's house 
It was already dawn outside, and after walking a little, he stopped. Jack thought that Chuck Gordon's father was a former plant director, and he had quite a few connections, and he would definitely be able to help him. Returning home, Jack simply collapsed on the bed, saying that he was very tired. Holding on with all his strength, he thought about Nick Locke, about the fact that he had lost all the money, and how he would survive this with his girlfriend. After sleeping a little, Jack went into a tea house in Vouvay, ordered some tea. A nice man asked for five fen for a cup of tea. As the young man began to pour tea for hops, he asked how his eldest son Luke was doing. Jack replied that he quit. The guy grinned and said that he didn't know what was on Luke's mind. Sipping his tea, Jack thought that the 80s were difficult. Many millionaires started their businesses around this time. The thought came to him what would happen if he returned to 2020 now. He immediately dropped this thought because it would be very stupid. He would miss such a wonderful opportunity. Jack grabbed his head and began to scold himself because he already has a hard-earned career. His face became serious. He decided everything for himself. After he deals with Frank, he will return to where he came from. Chuck Gordon was riding a motorcycle with an air of importance and confidence on his face that he looked very cool. Jack saw through the window how Chuck drove up on a motorcycle. He said to himself that our hero had arrived. Hops came out of the tea house and waved to Gordon, shouting brother Chuck to him. The man turned towards the sound and was surprised at the meeting. Jack approached Chuck, saying what a coincidence it was that they met. Gordon, shyly, said that he had just finished helping his grandfather and was very tired. The hero raised his hands up and invited Chuck to have lunch together as compensation for yesterday. Gordon laughed and said it was nothing, but Jack disagreed and they headed to the restaurant. The young people sat down at a large round table and the waitress approached them and handed them a menu. Seeing the prices, Jack's eyes bulged greatly. They were insanely high. Chuck turned to Hops and said that it was very polite of him. He thought that everything in the restaurant was very expensive. Jack stood up and began pouring Moatai vodka for Gordon, saying that everything was fine, and he was very lucky to have lunch with him, so he could not deny himself anything. Steve Jones and Bob Brown and their girls entered the restaurant. According to Steve, they serve very tasty food. Walking through the restaurant, Steve looked around the tables. At some point, he saw a familiar face. Jones recognized Jack and began a dialogue in the middle of the restaurant, accusing Jack of coming to waste money. Hops, without answering or paying attention, put another piece of divine food into his mouth and happily continued his meal. But Steve was clearly not satisfied with this. He began shouting that Jack was a freak and that Helen was eating then. Catherine looked at them and said that she had lost her appetite. She suggested they eat somewhere else. Bob took Steve by the elbow and began to pull him away, inviting him and urging him on. Chuck looked at Jack and asked if he had problems with Frank's son. Hops replied that they were in the same class and often quarrelled. Gordon lit a cigarette, took a long drag and exhaled, saying that he noticed that Jack was giving in to him. Hops looked at Chuck, apologised and asked a counter question about his relationship with Frank because it seemed to him that Gordon was not happy when Jack answered the question. Chuck said that when they were choosing the director of the plant, Frank gave his vote to Kevin Hobbs, which is why Gordon did not become director, he only lacked one vote. Chuck continued more angrily, because before him his father was the director until he retired. Gordon, very angry, hit the table with his fist, shouting that Frank was a traitor. Jack stood up and began to calm Chuck down, and invited him to drink more wine. Gordon agreed. Taking advantage of the moment, Jack asked with a sweet smile that Kevin Hobbs was not the son of the director of the Lin Shui steel plant. Chuck drank another glass of wine and said that none of this was true, that Dave was a simple guy who was on good terms with a foreign supplier. Hops looked Gordon straight in the eyes and asked why Chuck didn't go to live at sea rather than bother with this stupid plant, to which Gordon replied that he thought the same thing, but his father was against it. Chuck straightened up and raised his index finger up and told Jack that one of his friends made electrical appliances in Shahai last year and earned more than 100,000 at one time. With a smile on his face, Without giving up, he noted that with $100,000, he became a millionaire and asked how long it would take for him to run out of money. Jack smiled and gave a thumbs up and replied that it was very cool. Hops leaned closer to Chuck and asked that soon the plant would pay a fee for the prevention of heat strokes, and there was a considerable amount, Gordon agreed. Jack became more serious and proposed a plan. It was for Chuck to supply the fruits collected by his family to the factory workers and receive that very treasured money. Gordon waved his hands, even a little frightened and shouting that no, he did not agree. He explained that if he did that, he would be in trouble if his grandfather found out. Jack continued with a smile that this was where he came in, and that Chuck's grandfather would also be his grandfather. 
Gordon sat in bewilderment at what was said, repeating Jack's last words. Hops explained that he would be the middleman delivering the fruit. Chuck would just use his name. Gordon jumped out of his chair. He was surprised why he didn't even think about it himself. And taking Jack by the shoulder, he called him a genius. They left the restaurant hugging. Jack offered to walk Chuck home. Gordon had drunk a lot and could barely stand on his feet. He asked Hops if he knew how to drive a motorcycle, to which the main character replied that it was not that difficult. They got on the motorcycle and Jack drove Chuck home, Gordon complimenting Hops on his good driving. The time was already late when Hops returned home. Opening the door, he thought that Helen was already sleeping at that time. But looking into the room, he saw her sad and sitting on a chair in a nightie. Closing the door behind him, he asked his wife why she was not sleeping at such a late hour. Smiling a little, he began to scratch the back of his head and asked for forgiveness for being so late. Helen turned away a little without answering. She remembered the morning conversation with Catherine. Catherine came when Jack was no longer at home. She screamed that Helen was more important than her unfortunate hubby than her whole family, that her mother was hospitalized. She was still in a coma. And when Catherine came to her, she muttered only about Helen. Jack's wife stood very upset and said with tears in her eyes that her husband had changed a lot. But Catherine continued to shout that the cancer would sooner hang on the mountain than the moral monster would correct himself. What else could be expected from a player who only knows how to beat women every day? Because of the long looming silence, Jack began to approach Helen and ask what happened. Tears began to flow from her and she abruptly rushed into her husband's arms, screaming his name. Pressing herself tightly against his chest, she said that Jack could do whatever he wanted to her. Jack was very confused. He could not answer anything because Helen pressed her breast tightly against him. After moving away a little and lying on the sofa, Jack collected his thoughts and called his wife. He took her hands and said that he wasn't feeling well and would go for a walk and let her go to bed without him. Lowering his head under the tap with cold water, Jack convinced himself that he needed to calm down. He was going to return and there was no need to do what was not asked. Early in the morning, at dawn, Helen left the house with a small purse. Pausing a little with sadness in her eyes, she mentally said goodbye to her husband. Quickening her pace, she said in her head that if Jack had changed a little earlier, she wouldn't have had to wait so long. Helen dialed the number, putting the receiver to her ear. A familiar voice came out of her, asking who was on the line. She just had to say, Dad. And without letting her say anything further, her father asked what happened, and he is always ready to help. With a little fear in her voice, pausing every word, she said that everything was fine, and she just missed her a lot. The voice on the phone told her to stay put. He said he would take her home. Jack came to Chuck in the garden, and Gordon said that he told his father about the plan, and surprisingly, he was not indignant and even agreed. Hop said that they were very lucky that Chuck had such connections, to which Gordon smiled and said that if things went well, he would pay Jack 100 yuan. With a smile, Hops folded his hands in front of him and told Chuck not to worry and everything would be fine. Auntie Wong called out to Jack and said that his relatives had come to see him. He froze in place and repeated his aunt's last words. With a serious expression on his face, he said in his head that Helen's family had arrived. Jack, opening the gate doors with a serious face, enters the yard and sees. In front of him on the porch are Samuel and Carolyn Smith, Helen's parents, and she is next to them. Jack, with a smile, raising his voice a little, turning to Helen's parents, asked when they managed to arrive. He would prepare for their arrival. Samuel looked at Hop silently, with contempt, and did not deign to answer him. Jack came closer to his parents, asked if they were hungry, and offered to try something from his performance. But Helen's father couldn't stand it, and with a strong swing, slapped Jack in the face, shouting what kind of daughter he was. Removing his hand, he continued to scream for Jack to see what he was doing to his daughter. Helen, with tears welling up, shouted at her father to stop. Samuel, making a strong swing, shouts that it was from him personally, but then he hears his daughter's scream. He froze, not having time to strike another blow. Helen rushed to run to Jack as best she could. Running up to him, she timidly and with apprehension in her voice asked Hops if he was okay. Jack turned to Helen with sadness in his eyes, saying that her father had done everything right, that he had been a disappointment to her in the past. Approaching a little, looking straight into her eyes, he asked for forgiveness. But Samuel could no longer be stopped. He shouted at Jack not to talk to Helen and that they should get a divorce immediately. They stood in absolute silence for about a minute with stone faces. Carolyn could not stand it and screamed at Jack that she was asking to spare her daughter and began to clear her throat. Samuel approached his wife and said that he was asking her to calm down and not get angry. Jack looked straight into Helen's eyes with a serious face and asked her what she thought about this. 
She averted her eyes and took a step back and began to move away from him, turning away with a straight face and sadness in her voice. She turned to Jack and said that they needed to get a divorce. They came to the registry office. The young man behind the counter turned to Helen and Jack, saying that all that was left was to write and everything would be done. They both faded with sadness in their eyes. They stood silently and waited for the divorce to end. While stamping the divorce certificate, the man said that he did not understand the younger generation. Leaving the registry office, Helen asked her parents to go talk to Jack alone. She handed Hops a stack of money, saying that this was the money he gave her, 285 yuan. He moved her hand away and, addressing her by name, told her to keep them for herself, that he already owed her too much and he was ashamed to take anything from her. Looking into her eyes, he said that if he suddenly returned to his old way of life, she would break all ties with him. Helen opened her mouth in surprise and asked Jack what he meant. Jack began to turn her around and said that she had already understood him correctly, so that she should go. Otherwise her parents were already waiting for her. The girl wanted to say something, but he did not let her do it and sent her to her parents. He waved after her with a smile on his face and shouted for her to take care of herself. Without dropping her catch again, Helen walked to her parents, tears flowing down her cheeks. Jack met Chuck. He happily waved at him and shouted that they had succeeded. He ran to Hops and said that the plant had sent a notice that the payment for heat warning would be replaced with fruit. Sparkling with happiness, he continued that they promised 1,500 yuan for each payment. Gordon turned to Jack saying that he hoped for further cooperation and he himself would personally pay him everything when everything was done. Hops thanked Chuck and said that they hadn't even bought the packages yet. They were riding a motorcycle, and Gordon said that the nearest plastic factory was in Lujing, to which Jack asked him if he knew anyone there, because the factory wouldn't deal with small businesses. Chuck turned gloomy and said that he thought that Jack had friends there, to which Hops replied that he had no one there either, and then he would have to come up with something. Chuck became wary and said that they would be discovered if they did not get the package. They arrived at a large factory that said environmentally friendly plastic, high quality. Chuck asked how they would enter there. Jack decided to immediately go there. The guard ran out shouting who they were and where they were going. Hop stopped and turned towards the security guard and told him to call the boss because they had a serious matter and the hotline was inaccessible as always. The guard, surprised, asked that they were looking for Edgar Anderson. Jack asked what office he was in, to which the guard replied that he was on the third floor in the first room to the left of the stairs. They drove longer and Chuck said that they got inside, but what to do next, they don't know the director. But Jack replied that Gordon would need to keep quiet. They found Edgar's office and knocked. Anderson was sitting and drinking tea at his desk. When he heard a knock on the door, he invited them in. Seeing the men entering the office, Edgar asked who they were. Jack, putting his hand to his chest with a smile, greeted him and introduced himself as the director of the Guoda Fruits Company, saying that he was very glad to see him. Edgar asked in surprise how they got there, to which Hops replied that they alerted the guards and that he was on his way to Jihai to purchase a shipment of plastic bags. Jack said that he heard that Anderson also has good packages and he is engaged in exporting fruit. Cooling his tea, Edgar said Hops' last words and became thoughtful. After a short silence, Edgar said that his bags were definitely not suitable for them for exporting fruit. Taking a couple of cigarettes out of the pack, Jack asked how they wouldn't fit. Turning to Edgar and handing him the cigarettes, he said that he had gone to Linshui to buy fruit, but they had run out of packaging. Helping Anderson light a cigarette, Jack continued that the fact was that they had not calculated the cost of transport, so they came to him, to which Edgar said that he understood everything. Opening his arms with a smile, Hop said that, however, Quality assurance is their priority. They have a big company after all. Putting the mug on the table, Edgar asked whether their enterprise was public or private. Ignoring the question, Jack asked if Anderson would like to have some tea, because he himself really wanted tea, to which Edgar was surprised. Anderson took tea from the shelf, saying that he had completely forgotten to pour tea for them, and that this tea was ordinary. Bought in a store, he hoped that the men would not mind. Jack turned to Edgar and said that they had a fairly large order, and that they could make one ton of bags in half a month. Opening his mouth in surprise, Anderson's cigarette almost fell out. He asked if they really needed a ton. Jack agreed. Thinking for a moment, he said that if they worked overtime, then they should fit within the framework. Hops asked to look at the packages to check the quality. Edgar took them to the warehouse, showed them samples of plastic bags, and offered to inspect them for quality control. Jack shook Anderson's hand and said that he would send a person tomorrow to report the results of the check.
Edgar suggested that Hops and Gordon go to a restaurant and discuss something, but Jack refused, saying that they still had a lot to do. They said goodbye. Jack promised that he would see him next time. Satisfied Chuck, carrying the bags, said that it was awesome and that they didn't spend a single fen and they already had the bags. Jack turned around and asked Chuck to call Anderson tomorrow and tell him that the packages didn't pass quality control so the deal wouldn't go through. From Chuck Gordon's house, there are cries of admiration that you can carry a cow in this bag. Chuck sat at the table and put fruit in bags. Jack stood next to him and asked Gordon not to suffer from bullshit. Smiling, Hops reminded Chuck that he had promised to take him to a city restaurant. Gordon, with a smile, was surprised that Jack still remembered this. He had not yet tasted his grandfather's rice. Jack thought that he was missing something for the plan. He needed Nick Locke. Hop suggested that Chuck ask Nick for help. Gordon was very surprised and said that he cheated the last time they played. Jack suggested at least just calling him. They live next to each other, but see each other quite rarely. They arrived at the restaurant with Nick. He devoured the food with both hands, saying that the food was incredibly tasty and he hadn't eaten anything all day. It was already getting dark outside. Chuck drove home. Nick and Jack said goodbye to Gordon and Hop shouted that they would see each other soon. Locke smiled and looked at Dejka, asking him what he and Gordon were doing. Hop said that it was nothing. Nick began beating his chest, raising his voice. He said not to lie to him, and that Locke himself heard that Jack wanted to take him into some kind of deal. He said that he was ready. Hops hesitated a little, putting on a smile. He scratched the back of his head and began to speak, drawling, you know. Nick interrupted him and happily began to say that they had known each other for a hundred years, unlike Gordon. Moving a little closer to Nick, Jack told him everything as it happened. Locke, shouting, was very surprised that they were paying 200 yuan for some kind of fruit delivery. And even tomorrow, Nick said that he was not jealous. He just wanted to remind Hops that the last time they played, Gordon forced him to cheat, warned Jack not to let himself be fooled. At that moment, the main character thought that Locke is a bitch. He thinks that he is a fool. But smiling, Jack thanked Nick for reminding him that he was stupid and naive. And as soon as Chuck managed to fool him, he invited Locke to go with him for 50 yuan. Nick happily agreed and invited Jack to visit him for a short while. Hops agreed. They went to Nick's house. Jack was surprised at such a house and asked if Locke bought this house or rents it. Pouring water into a glass, Nick replied that he was renting. He had no money to buy. Jack was surprised and asked why, because Locke is the only mechanic in the area. There is no competition, but there is great demand. With a grin, the red-haired guy turned and said that he had given up a long time ago that he had been caught picking locks when the neighbors didn't know what he was doing. Jack was delighted and said that it was great that Nick could pick locks and asked to show him how it was done. Locke agreed and said that a hook-shaped tool is usually used for opening. With a smile on his face, Nick leaned towards the castle and said, Jack should look more carefully, otherwise he won't see anything. Locke put the hook in the lock and with a couple of hand movements, the lock opened. Jack looked at this with delight, with great joy and asked Nick to teach him the same. Nick raised his index finger up and waved it, disagreeing and saying that this was not legal and he did not want to set him up. Jack raised his index finger in front of Nick's face and said that he would pay a hundred yuan for this after the fruit deal. Locke's eyes lit up with happiness and temptation. Folding his hands, palms facing each other, he said that he agreed. Morning at the Lin Shui plant, Gordon had just arrived. Jack greeted him, waving his hand, indicating his location. Chuck was very surprised and asked why Nick had come. He was wearing a shirt and a beige jumper on top. Jack said that Locke would help them. Jack changed into work clothes, walking along the corridor of the plant. He thought that he could not afford to do this, that it was too early. The relationship between Frank and Kevin Jones was not the simplest. Hops was sure that some kind of fraud was going on between suppliers behind their backs. Chuck saw Jack and opened his mouth in surprise, pointing his finger at him. He asked what he was wearing. Hop smiled and said that he was a farmer and this was his headdress, placing the large hat on his head. Gordon smiled and gave a thumbs up, praised Jack and said that the fruit was in the warehouse. The rest was up to Hops. It was already the middle of the day and all the workers went to the canteen for lunch. Jack and Nick were transporting fruit. Jack said that at this time all the workers in the cafe were gaining strength to continue working. Locke suggested where the goods should be left. They began to unload the goods when suddenly Jack screamed and was twisted. Nick came up and asked what happened to him. Hop said that he had a severe stomach ache. Jack rushed to run, saying that he urgently needed to get out, and he trusted Nick to do everything to the end, and Hops would return later. The main character was running as fast as he could and thought that he needed to hurry while everyone was having lunch in the cafe. He found Frank's office 
and it turned out that the door was locked. Jack thought what a pest he was, closing the door when leaving for lunch. Hops took out the hook and said that it was good that he was prepared. A couple of hand movements and the door was open. The hero immediately rushed to the filing cabinets and almost immediately he finds the required folder with the purchase and sale agreement. After looking closely, Jack realizes that there is no stamp on the contract, but only an already signed agreement. There were a lot of books on the shelf. Jack noticed that these books were very good, but he doubted that Frank could even read enough to keep them. Hops, with a serious face and not letting go of the contract, began to take out a book from the shelf. He couldn't hold the book in his hand and it crashed to the floor. Jack got scared and wondered if it was really a book. He was surprised at how loudly it fell, as if it had broken. And at this moment, the book opens and some papers fall out of it. Hops was very surprised and looking at the floor, he realized that it was not a book, but a box. Jack decided to look at the papers in case there was something important there. He sat down on the floor and began to look at the papers. He found the required document and with a grin on his face, said that now Frank was finished. Hops returned to Nick, who started yelling at him because Jack had been gone for too long and Locke was almost done himself. Jack took out the money and pressed it to Nick's chest, saying that it was his hundred. Locke was very surprised. Hops turned and began to walk away, thanking Nick and saying that he could be free. Jack would take care of the rest. He walked, looking at the papers he found. And after reading everything carefully, it turned out that the director of a small factory had put an official seal and received 2.5 million yuan for it. Turning seriously without taking his eyes off the precious papers, he said that this was suicide. Walking down the street, Jack saw a group of Helen's friends. They saw Lilith Miller calling out to her. They said hello. The girl in the lilac dress waved to Lilith, and Steve even complimented her, saying that she looked great. Miller, approaching her friends, saw Jack behind them and asked what he was doing there. Jones was surprised to see Hops and laughingly said that Jack was walking on his own. Raising his hand, Steve said with a grin that he is lucky for divorced people. They have so much free time that they can finally devote to themselves. The girl in lilac said that it is not easy for a once married woman to get married again, to which Jones said that she had finally developed with this scumbag. It was long overdue. Ignoring all the caustic remarks, Jack walked past Steve and turned to Lilith. Jones was indignant that Hops did not react in any way and thought that Jack couldn't see him point blank. Angry, Steve rushed at the main character, grabbing him by the hand. He asked what he had put on himself, saying that it was a shame. Jack got angry, turned around and rushed at Jones, telling him not to be rude to him. Hops twisted Steve's hand. He didn't expect such a reaction and screamed that he was in great pain and asked Jack to let him go. The girl in lilac screamed, saying that Hops had gone crazy and demanding that he let Johnson go. Jack, with a straight face, lowered his hands and pushed Steve, telling him to go. Johnson flew straight towards the indignant girl. She did not expect this, and with bulging eyes, she watched Steve fall on her. Johnson and a girl in a lilac dress fell to the ground with deafening screams. Jack, with a serious face, stretching his arms, turned to Steve, saying that if you don't like the bullshit, then try saying it to his face. Otherwise, you're constantly barking like a bitch. An enraged Steve got down on his knee and started shouting at Jack, asking him what he had just said. The main character folded his arms across his chest with a grin and said, If you speak to me, you translate to yourself. Getting even more angry, he started shouting at Hops, saying why he was fucking himself. He got money from Frank, that he was now pretending to be the devil. Jack spread his arms and said that his father only had two Mondays to live. Steve replied that Hops had already fucked him up and now he would screw him. The hero leaned over to him and asked what he would do, since his dad hadn't changed anything since April. Steve looked at Hops with fear and confusion and asked his last words. And then memories surfaced in his head of how his father shouted that he had a lot of money and he was leaving for a hotel with some girl. Confused, he sat on the ground and no longer noticed anyone, only repeating the same thing. No, this cannot be. Jack turned around and leaving, asked that he knew everything, didn't he? Jack walked on, Everyone stood in bewilderment at what happened, and Steve continued to kneel. Hops turned to Lilith and asked her not to call, saying that he would pay for the call. They came to Miller's house. She answered the phone and asked to dictate the number. Jack said that he needed to call the Xinyuan hardware factory and ask for Adam Fletcher. Lilith said that they answered, and for him to pick up the phone. A voice sounded on the phone and asked what Jack was interested in. He asked to call Adam Fletcher to the phone. Adam went to the phone and asked who was talking to him. Hops introduced himself as the director of the Ling Shui steel plant. Fletcher said that he did not recognize the number and that it was not a work phone. Jack replied that it was new and he had very important business. 
Adam asked what happened, to which Hops raised his voice and began to say that the goods that Frank purchased from him in April and June did not pass quality control. Continuing to shout, Jack said that because of his low-quality equipment, a fatal incident occurred at the factory. Jack said that Adam would be held fully responsible for such negligence. Fletcher jumped up and shouted that he did not understand what the director was talking about. Frank called him specifically at that time, and he said that no additional details were needed. Jack asked why, in this case, the contract indicated exactly Adam's name in the responsible column. Fletcher shouted that why the hell it was written like that, and that Hobbs called manager Kevin Hobbs to the phone. Jack said that Kevin is now in the reception room, so Adam can call him himself. With a satisfied face, Jack hung up the phone, and only muffled beeps came out of it. Mr. Kevin Hobbs, director of the Ling Shui factory, stood in his office and drank tea. When suddenly the phone rang, Kevin did not expect this. Taking his mug away, he reached for the phone. Picking up the phone, he heard a man's voice who said hello and said that there were no contracts between him and Frank. Hobbs became serious and asked him to speak slowly and explain normally what happened. A sweaty Adam screamed into the phone that his company had not signed any contracts with Kevin's company in April, May and June. Hobbs was surprised and asked again that Frank had not signed any contracts with him for three months. Fletcher, continuing to shout, agreed and said that one of the employees called him and asked about them. Kevin became serious, beads of sweat running down his face, and the voice on the phone continued that he was told that he would be held responsible. Adam asked what was going on. In a serious voice, Hobbs asked what number they called him from. Having finished the conversation, Kevin began to rush around the office, talking to himself that they clearly did not call him from the factory numbers, which means it was someone from outside who called. And this already means that they know something and have evidence. Still reasoning in his head, Hobbs thought that April, May and June had the most sales, and they earned more than three million during this time. And then Kevin thought that if Frank didn't sign the contracts, then what was he spending the factory's funds on? Hobbs remembered that at this time, they had an accident in which a married couple died due to improper operation. Kevin understood everything and rushed to run to the phone. Nervously, he began to dial a number. He called Ben Davis and shouted at him to stop all the cars in the second department now and not to say anything to Frank. Jack stood with his elbows on the table, next to the phone, and with an important look said that everything would be soon. Lilith stood nearby in silence, not understanding what was happening. The phone rang and with a grin on his face, Hop said he was on his way. Kevin dialed the number and introduced himself. The voice on the phone said that he had all the evidence on Frank. Hobbs, turning serious, narrowed his eyes and asked to tell him everything. Jack said that Frank forged an agreement with the Shin and Equipment Factory and gained more than three million yuan as a result of the deception. Kevin listened in anger and bewilderment to what he was told. Hobbs continued that Frank later signed a contract with the Sikh company and purchased the same number of spare parts. Kevin asked if Jack had all the evidence now. He answered positively. Hobbs said that he would arrive now. In a serious voice, Hops advised that Kevin go to the police on his own behalf because he did not want to be punished along with Frank. Hobbs said that he understood everything and sharply pressed the receiver into the phone. Thinking to himself, Kevin asked the question who it could be. The voice is very young, but this guy is very smart. Hearing the beeps on the phone, Jack thought that if he were Kevin, he would immediately go to the police because Hops had already done him a big favor. Lilith stood silently and looked at Jack. But in her head, she said that Hops called the director of the Lin Shui factory. It seemed that he was talking to him about something important. Kevin ran out and saw the car. He told its owner that he urgently needed to borrow a car. He did not mind. Jack was at Lilith's house and was waiting for Hobbs to arrive when suddenly there was a drain on the door and he headed there. Opening the door, Hops saw a bald man standing on the threshold who asked Jack if he had called him. Seeing Hops, Kevin seemed to recognize him and said in his head that it was not his father who died in that incident. The main character invited Hobbs to go into the house and held out precious papers and invited Kevin to look at them. After studying the papers, he realized that all the contracts were signed by Frank, and this would be enough to prove his guilt. Kevin took Jack by the shoulder and said that he was a real hero and asked what his name was. Hobbs, smiling, spread his arms and turned to Hobbs, telling him that Kevin himself found the evidence on Frank, and Jack did nothing. The stomping of feet is heard from afar. Two policemen run into the room addressing Kevin Hobbs. A young man in uniform asked what happened and who he was talking to on the phone while he was running somewhere. Jack looked away. Kevin stood silently, thinking about everything that was happening, 
Hobbs concluded that Hops immediately decided to arrange everything to protect him from responsibility. Kevin handed the papers to the police officer, turning to him. He offered to look at them. Hobbs said that he found these contracts in Frank's office, and this is direct evidence of his fraudulent scheme. Looking at Jack, Kevin continued that two people had died because of these machinations, and he would tell everything in detail. As Kevin passed by Jack, he took him by the shoulder, thus expressing his gratitude and respect. Time seemed to fly by as Jack gave his testimony. The officer asked Kevin if he confirmed that everything Hobbs said was true. Hobbs answered yes. Addressing the main character, the officer asked if Frank knew that his schemes had been discovered, to which Jack replied that he did not think so. Putting his fingers to his chin, Hop said that right now Frank could be at home or in his office at work. He could be found through his next of kin. The officer was surprised and thought about how Jack knew that he wanted to catch Frank. The police officer said that he would immediately send a squad and Kevin should go with the officer to the station. Frank was at work. With complete calm, he was about to drink freshly brewed tea. Looking up, he realized that the books were not in the correct order. In complete confusion, he dropped his mug of hot tea directly to the floor. Frank grabbed the box, and when he opened it, he screamed in rage that the contract was lost. He calmed down and began to remember that some farmer had recently worked here. Trying to concentrate on this thought, I said in my head that this guy didn't look like a factory worker, that he had definitely seen him somewhere, that he looked like someone. When he realized who this farmer was, his eyes turned red with anger, he was furious. Jack came to his sister's house. Little Mark opened the door for him. He was pleasantly surprised to see his older brother on the threshold. Sarah was sitting at the table with her classmates. They were preparing for exams. Charlie entered the room and asked what fate brought Hops to their home. He answered that he was just passing by. With a smile, he turned to Sarah and reminded her that she would have exams soon. The girls looked at him warily. Sarah nodded in agreement. Smiling a little shyly, he said that he would like to say a few words to her. Sarah's classmates got up from the table and said that they had to go, but they would see each other tomorrow. The girl tugged at her friend's t-shirt and asked him to be quick, otherwise they wouldn't have time. As she was leaving, she began to say something. The young man asked Adeline to let him go. Suddenly Jack wanted to tell him something important, but the girl assumed that he had lost everything again and had come to sell something. Hops turned to the sisters with a smile on his face and said that he had dealt with Frank. Jack told them not to worry about him anymore. Sarah stood with a surprised face and pointed her finger towards the door, saying Frank's name. The main character did not understand what his sister was saying and decided to turn around. He stood in the doorway, his eyes burning with rage. He walked onto the threshold of the house. Jack stood forward and shielding his family with his entire body, he told him to come in. Aggressive Frank began to shout, insulting him and the fact that it really was Jack. They rushed at hops, enraged like a rabid animal. He shouted for Jack to return everything to him. The main character took a step to the side and grabbed his hand. Frank clearly did not expect this. Jack twisted his hand so that he started screaming and asking him to let him go. With a smirk on his face, Hops continued to hold him and asked him what exactly he needed back, the contracts with the Zinyan company and the Sikh company. Frank continued to resist and scream, asking where the agreement was and demanding that Jack return everything to him. Hops told him that he didn't seem to understand what he was getting into, wringing Frank's hand even more. He continued to scream in pain. Jack threw his hand and pushed him to the ground, pinning him with his foot. Hops, with a calm expression on his face but anger in his eyes, walked up to the table, took the bottle and broke the bottom. The girls, seeing this, stood, not understanding what was happening. They could not believe what Jack was going to do. He walked up to Frank, grabbed him, he pressed the edges of the broken bottle to his throat and asked. Now he finally understood what he had gotten himself into. Frank took a breath of air. Drops of sweat began to flow down his face from fear. He realized that he could not get out of it and answered positively. Jack shouted if he understood correctly and punched him with his fist, causing Frank to lose a couple of his teeth. He fell to the floor screaming, screaming and groaning in pain. Trying to get up, he tried to speak. With long breaks, he said that he had said that he knew what he had gotten himself into, that Hop still needed him. Approaching Frank, Jack, raising his voice and clenching his fists, said that this was revenge for his parents. Sarah could no longer stand aside and clenching her hands into fists, she screamed Frank's name. Charlie asked her to stop and held her, pressing her to herself. Frank shouted to Jack that he was not involved in their death. They had known each other for years and he was sorry that this happened. The main character opened his mouth wide in surprise and with regret in his eyes, he said that he understood everything. Frank had hope in his eyes and began to continue what he was saying. Frank jumped up and started shouting for Jack to give him the contract, that it was state property.
and if they found out that he had it, he would be arrested. Hops calmly said that he would give him the contract. Frank asked where it was. Having hugged him, Jack said that he had hidden him. Why hang around with him? And Frank agreed and said that they needed to go to Hops. Sarah and Charlie stood there in disbelief at what had happened. They just stared after them. Jack turned around and looked at them with a smile, letting them know that he had everything under control and they were safe. Walking further away from Sarah's house, Frank asked Hops where they were going. Jack, with a serious face, told his uncle to be quiet and suggested that they first talk about how they would divide the money. Frank spread his arms and asked what kind of money we were talking about, and that time he gave it all to him. Jack hit him in the face with his elbow, telling him not to lie to him, otherwise he would take the contract to his superiors. He collapsed on the floor. Hops asked where he hid 2.5 million. Frank was surprised that Jack knew everything. Hops, with his arms outstretched, began to approach him, saying that he would stop pretending, and besides, he didn't want to take a yuan from him. Frank asked why all this was then. Jack told him with a grin not to worry. Since Hops was on his side, he shouldn't think that he would leave him, otherwise he would get into trouble with him. Getting even closer to him, he said that only when Frank bought new equipment in July would he have to replace the low-quality equipment with high-quality equipment, and then no one would understand anything. Frank began to rise from his knees. He agreed with Jack and suggested moving on. It was already evening outside. The whole sky was illuminated by an incredibly beautiful sunset. They came to the cemetery. Frank began to dig something up. Having dug a hole, he took out a large bag and told Jack that here was a hundred thousand, just so that he would not forget about the agreement. Hops opened the bag and saw large stacks of money. He smiled widely. Jack told Frank that he would go buy something and that he should not go anywhere. They came to a clothing store. Frank waited outside, and after some time, Hops came out of the store with packages. Approaching him, the main character said that he needed to change clothes because his torn suit raised unnecessary questions. Frank agreed and said that this sounded reasonable. Buttoning his shirt, he asked Jack where his contract was. Hops said that he hid the contract under a red brick near a trash can near Frank's house, who shouted that why such an important document should be stored in such a place. Frank rushed towards the house, saying that it didn't matter anymore and he needed to go quickly. Quickening his pace, he said where the documents were so as not to forget. Approaching the house, Frank saw a man near the gate. It was Mr. Davis. The man asked what Ben was doing here. Ben Davis had been waiting for Frank for about an hour, and then he finally came. Davis was delighted to see him. Ben screamed loudly, pointing his finger at Frank and saying that here he came. He stood there, perplexed by what was happening, when suddenly he heard the pitter-patter of feet. It all happened too quickly. Frank didn't even have time to understand anything, when suddenly his hands were twisted behind his back and someone was shouting at him not to move. Frank started screaming, asking why he was being arrested. The police officer raised his voice, telling Frank not to resist. Raising his head, he saw Jack in the crowd, and then Frank realized that he had set it all up. Hop stood pleased and watched the arrest of his enemy. He was satisfied with the work done. And then Frank realized why he bought him a new suit and began to avoid him. Jack wanted to prove his innocence. He asked Frank to wash his hands, and no one knows that they went for the buried money. Because his hands are clean, he can't drag Hops to jail now. Frank realized that Jack had been pretending all this time from the moment he asked him for money. He screamed at the top of his voice for the police to let him go. As Jack left, he heard the officers say that the suspect had lost consciousness and that they needed to pin him down and prevent him from doing anything. He closed his eyes and said in his head to Helen that he had dealt with Frank and now he needed to leave. It was already dark outside. Jack and his sisters and younger brother were sitting at the table. Hop said that tomorrow everyone will know that Frank was caught red-handed. Jack said that now he would show them, but on one condition, that he should not squeal or scream. The relative sat in bewilderment, and the main character reached for his bag. Opening it and lifting it up, bundles of money fell onto the table with a crash. Seeing so much money, the girl squealed in surprise. Jack put his index finger to his mouth and motioned for them to stop screaming. Sarah looked at Hops with a serious face and asked where he got so much money. Taking one of the packets, Jack said that this was the money their parents sacrificed themselves for that day. The main character thought, and all this time, flashed through his eyes from the moment he first saw Frank and took compensation from him for the death of his parents, and he told the whole story to his relatives. Hops continued that this is how it all happened. Turning to Sarah, he said that he would leave all this money for her safekeeping, and if she wanted to spend this money on something expensive, then let her discuss this issue with Charlie. Hanging his head, he said that if he returned to his old life and came to ask for money, there was a pause in the air. 
Raising his head with a serious face, he raised his index finger up and said that in this case they should not give him anything, not even Fen. The girls looked at him with bulging eyes, without saying a word. Slamming his hand on the table, Hop said it was time for him to go and reminded them to hide the money. He turned around and headed for the door. Sarah jumped up and asked her brother to stop. Jack stopped and asked what happened. Sarah shyly said that it was already evening and invited him to stay for dinner. Hops smiled and refused, saying that he still had a lot to do and that thanks to this money, they would no longer have problems with food. The main character, with a smile and hope in his eyes, turned to Sarah and asked her to call him brother again. She widened her eyes in surprise and suddenly remembered how Jack once came and they fought a lot. When little Mark was still very small, Hops smiled and began scratching the back of his head. He said goodbye to his sisters and brother and headed towards the exit. The door slammed. They stood in surprise saying goodbye to their brother. Only Mark was happy with everything that was happening. Jack left the house and exhaled, walking down the street. He thought in his head that they might not see each other soon. On the way home, the main character went into a store and bought a couple of bottles of alcohol and some food. Leaving the store, Jack said that a little more and he would not have made it to the store in time. With a grin on his face, he said that two bottles of high-proof rice wine should be enough. Jack sat at home alone and drank wine straight from the bottle, eating stew. Blushing all over and removing the bottle from his mouth, he shouted that it was very spicy. At one point, Hops turned his head to the other end of the sofa and imagined Helen sitting next to him and smiling, putting his hand on the headboard of the sofa. Jack listed the names of all his relatives and said goodbye to them. And throwing back the bottle, he began to forcefully take a couple more sips. A memory flashed before my eyes of him standing with his colleagues and drinking to his promotion. He saw his tombstone standing, with his photograph and many people around it. Morning came. Strong snoring could be heard from the main character's house. He was lounging on the sofa. One of the bottles was lying next to him on the sofa. Apparently, he fell asleep suddenly, without even having time to put it on the table. Opening his eyes, Jack cursed and jumped up and asked why he was still here. He began to stomp his feet heavily and become indignant, saying that they had already buried him in that life. Continuing to scream, he asked why he couldn't come back anymore. Exhaling, he began to calm down, and he concluded that it all seemed useless. On his knees, he said that he could no longer return to his life. Jack stood in front of the mirror and buttoned his shirt. He looked at the photograph. It was him and Helen, and then they were both happy. Looking at the photo in his head, Jack said that if he had known that he could not return, he would not have let her leave then. He would not have let her go so easily. Taking the photograph in his hand, the main character thought that if Lilith Miller could contact Catherine Smith, it meant that she could contact Helen. There was a knock on the door, and when he opened it, Jack saw his sisters and brother on the threshold and asked how they ended up here. He invited them into the house and suggested that they have lunch together. He just wanted to cook noodles. Sarah shyly turned to Jack and called him brother. She suggested that he come to them for lunch and that she bought meat. The whole family went home to their sisters. They walked with joy. For the first time in a long time, their family was reunited again. At one point, Mark stopped and asked Jack if he could stay with them. Hop smiled and leaned towards his brother, scratching his head. He asked little Mark to be patient a little until the end of the month, and then he would be with them. Sarah turned to her elder brother with a smile and said that the whole of Ling Shui now knows about the incident with Frank. In addition to him, several more of his relatives were arrested, who were also involved in the incident. With satisfaction, Hop said that he knew it and hoped that Frank would receive the death sentence. Charlie and Mark, with joy on their faces, screamed in one voice, an eye for an eye, which is exactly what he needs. Hops was surprised and asked Mark if he was already so big that he knew sayings. The kid replied that he knew a few more sayings. Lilith was at home and heard screams. Opening the front door, she saw a girl with a lilac dress and a bald guy on the threshold. She asked them what happened. The girl screamed loudly, asking Lilith for help. She took her hand and said that she and Bob were Jack's friends and that they were asking him to dissuade him, and she burst into tears. Bob, hearing the screams, looked out from behind the door, and when he saw the guys, he asked what happened. The girl with the lilac dress said that it was so good that Brown was nearby. The bald guy began to say that he thought that they had already heard about the incident with Steve's father. He himself was also taken to the police, and if he understands everything correctly, then Jack is one of the announcers. Bob asked why they were afraid because it didn't concern them at all, and there was no point in getting involved, the guy agreed. The young man told how that day he and Daisy had quarreled with Jack, and he then said that he could not forget because they were both hiding evidence from him. Daisy shouted, she and Cortez Cook are close friends. What if the police arrest them too? 
They continued to ask for help. Bob thought about it and said that he did not think that it was Jack who reported to the police and suggested that they go to him and ask about it. Cortez yelled that they needed to go faster. Meanwhile, Sarah was studying for her exams. Mark was sitting playing on the floor and Charlie was cleaning up the house. Jack came out with a large plate of meat and told the relatives to remember to wash their hands before eating. There was a lot of food on the table and Hops asked the kid if he liked the food. Mark replied that he liked everything and it was very tasty. While enjoying his meal, Jack heard a knock on the door and heading towards the door, he said that he would open it himself. Having opened the main door, the hero saw Bob on the threshold and was surprised at his arrival. Jack, taking another bite, asked Brown that he had come to the smell of food. Lilith, Daisy and Cortez looked out from behind Bob and greeted him with smiles on their faces. Hops was very surprised by this turn of events and said in his head that they came to Dota to invite him to play. Jack invited them into the house and asked if they wanted to have something to eat. Addressing Mark, the main character with a smile asked him to bring plates and forks for the guests. Cook, with a smile on his face, refused to eat, saying that it was not worth it. They had recently eaten. Cortez said they came to discuss a small misunderstanding with him. The main character asked what misunderstanding they wanted to talk about. Bob plucked up the courage to take matters into his own hands and asked Jack if he had reported Daisy and Cortez to the police. Hops looked at them and said that's what they were talking about. And no, he hadn't snitched yet, but he was just about to after the meal. Daisy and Cortez screamed in one voice, not believing their ears. They asked him again. Bob began to stand up for them, saying that they had nothing to do with Frank's case. Maybe Jack would forgive them. Hops took another bite of meat, chewed it, and watched as Daisy and Cortez, with tears in their eyes, asked not to report them to the police. After living, the main character thought about it and said that it would be fair. Adams and Cook, with tears in their eyes and joyful faces, asked what it meant Jack wouldn't inform on them. Bob hugged Hops and patted him on the shoulder, saying that he believed that Jack was kind and fair. Sarah was preparing for the exams. With maximum concentration, he was solving mathematical problems. Jack carefully approached her and looked at her notebook. Hops, turning to his sister, said that she had solved the problem incorrectly. Sarah gave way to him and listened carefully to her brother. He took a pen and began to explain that for such examples, you need to use a formula. The girl was shocked. She couldn't believe that it was Jack who helped her find and correct this mistake. Sarah asked if Jack would stay overnight with them. He said that he should stay and help her prepare for her exams. Smiling, Jack thought that he had plans to start his own business in Zhihai, where Helen now lives, but that could wait until Sarah passed her exams. The main character was playing with his younger brother. Sarah looked into the room and asked if he would wash his feet. She heated water in a basin. Jack lowered his feet into the basin, and with pleasure he took a deep breath and said, what a thrill. He sat with his hands folded and a smile on his face, thinking that this is what he calls home. During the time that Jack lived with his sisters, he helped them with preparing the game, helped Sarah with preparation for exams and hung out clothes after washing. The day of the exams arrived, it was raining outside. Jack walked Sarah to the exams and with a smile on her face, she waved to him and told him to go home, otherwise he would get wet. Hops shouted joyfully to Sarah, wishing her good luck. Sarah asked him not to shout so much, otherwise they were still watching. Jack smiled widely. He stood and watched as his sister moved away from him, saying in his head that Sarah had finally gone to take her exams. Suddenly becoming serious, he thought that he was ready to prepare to move to Jehai. The rain had already stopped. Jack walked towards the house, passing the market. He became thoughtful. Hops remembered that there was still some meat at home, and he decided to buy noodles for dinner. Having bought noodles, Jack noticed how two men were discussing something. They were talking about the fact that the police had found not only buried money, but also money that relatives had hidden in their homes. The main character was interested in their conversation, and he decided to come closer. The men continued to say that this son of a bitch killed a lot of people for the sake of money. Killing him is not enough. Another supported him, saying that these fuckers in high positions who steal from the state should be on the plantation's work. One of the men said that he didn't even spend a yuan from government money. I wonder what he saved it for. The second man said that he didn't know either. Very nervous from what he heard, Jack pressed hard on the zucchini he was holding in his hands. One of the men saw this and raised his voice to Hops, asking why he was ruining his vegetables. Jack smiled and asked for forgiveness. He said that he wanted to buy it. And the main character ran as hard as he could, talking in his head about how he could forget that everything here is not the same as in his time. You can't just go and quickly spend all the money, especially in such a small linchui. Hops began to sweat, and thought that if they found out that they hadn't found all the money, they would start an even bigger investigation. 
and then Frank would definitely turn him in. As he continued to run, he thought that even though he had helped the cause, if they had suspicions, they would not leave him alone. Jack ran into the house shouting to Charlie to quickly bring all the money to him. Charlie was clearing empty plates from the table when she heard her brother scream. She turned around and asked what happened. Jack, out of breath, said that he had not calculated everything, and they would have to return the money urgently so that she would not worry and that they would be able to provide for themselves. Hops changed into farmer's work clothes and came to the cemetery, to the same place where he was with Frank. As he came closer, he realized that they had not dug this grave and that it was good that they did not yet know about this place. He was saved. At the police station, Frank is sitting behind bars with a police officer standing near his cell. Kevin Hobbs approached the employee and asked what the situation was, to which the officer replied that 100,000 yuan was missing. Frank claimed that Jack Hobbs stole it. Kevin was indignant and said that this cannot be because Jack helped the cause so much. Why would he expose himself like that? Thomas lowered his head and said in a serious voice that we were talking about a hundred thousand. Officer Cooper said that Frank's testimony coincided with reality. Before Frank was captured, Jack really was with him. The investigation confirmed everything. Hobbs followed the officer down the hall and Thomas said that Jack was too suspicious. They would need to bring him in for questioning. Kevin grabbed Cooper's hand and asked if he could meet Hobbs himself first. But the officer abruptly threw his hand away and turned to Hobbs saying that if they had not been friends for many years, he would have suspected Kevin. The officer turned around and began to walk away from Hobbs, saying that this matter must be resolved. Thomas Cooper ordered that Kevin not be released from the station until Jack Hobbs was arrested. The main character bought himself ice cream, and while eating it, he thought that he was happy too early. When he thought that he would leave this world, he almost made a terrible mistake. Jack stood and watched the two men play checkers, and continued to think that fortunately, he was not able to return. One of the men made the right move and said that it was checkmate. Laughing at his opponent, he said that he did not keep track of his knight. The officers saw Jack and ran towards him, shouting that he was there. Hops turned around, eating ice cream. He thought that they had come for him, and now it was his turn to checkmate. Jack and the officer were sitting in the interrogation room, and Thomas Cooper asked Hops where the hundred thousand yuan was, to which he answered with a question pretending that he did not understand what hundred thousand they demanded of him. In a more stern voice, Officer Cooper continued to say that we were talking about the hundred thousand that Jack took from Frank by blackmail. With a serious face, Hops looked the officer in the eyes and asked what Frank had told them. Thomas got furious and jumped up and started shouting that he was the only one asking questions here, and you couldn't answer a question with a question. Jack spread his arms and said that he did not take anything. The officer asked why he took Frank to him. Hops replied that he wanted to see his evidence. Cooper raised his index finger up and suggested that Jack next threatened him with denunciation and thus forced him to give up a hundred thousand. The main character, raising his voice, said that he did not take anything. The officer, lowering his head, asked if this was true. Jack answered positively, folding his hands in front of him. Thomas asked that at that moment Frank did not yet know that he was wanted, so why did Hops go with him? The hero leaned his elbows on his knees and said that his parents died because of him. Gritting his teeth, he said that he wanted to see himself being arrested. Jack couldn't stand it, jumped up and shouted to the whole room that Frank deserved life in prison and he needed to be locked up. The officer stood in shock, his mouth open in surprise. Having collected himself a little, he asked Hops to be quiet and calm down. Thomas continued that Frank said that he buried a hundred thousand and then dug it up and gave it to you. Jack asked, that is... Frank brought you to dig into his ancestors. Kevin, who was standing in the next room, watched the interrogation, and Jack's question made him laugh. Hops raised his index finger and said he had a couple of doubts. Jack began to list that firstly, Frank stated that he was digging, but his clothes were clean. And secondly, suddenly, he was trying to leave some of the money for his son. Officer Cooper thought he stood up and headed towards the exit from the interrogation room, leaving the door slammed. Jack smiled thinking that the officer had listened to his words, and that was to his advantage. Thomas approached the sergeant and ordered him to check Frank's testimony and find out where he went with Jack. Kevin and Cooper stood in the corridor. Hobbs circled the officer, waiting for the results. A sergeant rushed into the corridor shouting that they had found a hundred thousand and that they really were there. Kevin Hobbs was very happy, not believing his ears. He asked again that they had really found everything. The sergeant spread his arms and said exactly one hundred thousand, where Frank said he and Jack Hops were. Kevin, smiling, turned to the officer and thanked him for his help, handing him a cigarette from the pack. 
Thomas refused and said that there was no need for formalities. The officer turned around and began to leave. Hobbs asked that Hops was now free. The officer waved his hand and agreed. They walked down the street and Kevin invited Jack to go to a restaurant at his expense as a token of his gratitude. The main character smiled and raised his index finger, refusing and saying that maybe another time he could go. But for now, he has to return home. His family is waiting and worried about him. As he started to walk away, Jack turned around and said that he wanted to ask something about him. Kevin smiled and said not to worry that he sent a letter to the relevant authorities and the answer would be in a couple of days, to which Hops replied that he needed to receive compensation as soon as possible because he had difficulties with money. Scratching his head, Jack smiled and said that he was also unemployed. Kevin said that there was no need for formalities and he would send another letter and send him an answer within a week. Hobbs continued, since Frank is under arrest, Jack can take over his job. Hobbs turned away and thought about how much he would earn at the factory and decided that it was better to go to Jahai. Jack smiled, putting his hands in front of him and thanking Hobbs, he said that he would refuse. Kevin was surprised because Hobbs needs a job so much, but he takes it and refuses, leaving Jack said goodbye to Hobbs and headed home. Lilith stood with the children on the playground and they were about to play jump rope. Mella began jumping over the stretched elastic band and reciting a little rhyme about two chickens and two goslings going out for a walk. Jack walked to Lilith and saw her playing. He was surprised and thought about what Miller does in his free time. Jack called out to Lilith and started waving his hand at her. She was afraid that her image was now ruined.